I made that sketch on an airplane, and that's the only thing I brought with me. And I laid it on the table because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. This is a building not just about the Holocaust. Hitler and the Third Reich, the Wehrmacht, the SS, Himmler, all of them, it wasn't that they wanted to only kill Jews, they wanted to void the culture and the history of the Jews. They wanted to pretend that Jews never existed. The story of the Holocaust is embedded in the building. It's bifurcated in two. This side is angular, this side is softer. The dark building here is oriented 5.9 degrees, which happens to be precisely at its location toward the west wall in Jerusalem. You enter into a dark building and you go down as you're moving through history. You get to the hinge point, which is between the two wings. And from that point, you rise toward the light and thus education. So it can never happen again. The white building, which you ultimately arrive at and come out, is oriented due east. And it's about anticipating a Messiah. Almost 100% of buildings in the world, you go in one way and come back the same way. You turn on yourself. This building, is about leaving another way because it's a linear journey, because life is a linear journey. So it starts with the two columns, which are the two columns from the first temple, so-called Solomon's Temple, and they are the exact size of the columns described in the Bible. 1 Kings 5 through 9 describes them entirely in measurement. These are the exact size of the columns. Not only the exact diameter, not only the exact height, not only the column capitals, but the space between them. So these two columns are guarding nothing anymore. Therefore, they're evacuated. So thus the webbing structure, there's nothing in them. They're not sacred because the Ten Commandments left. So those two columns are highly symbolic. Away from the building is a wall and a fountain. And the wall has niches uh, with the names of Gentiles who saved Jews during the Holocaust. Some of them are very famous indeed. Oscar Schindler being one. There are lots of unsung heroes, people who just out of their own humanity did their best to save Jews and themselves sometimes got killed in the process. So the fountain is a dedication to them. And the wall, like everything else, is out of rough concrete. And there's nothing pretty about the use of materials there. Thus the stones, the hardscape, as you enter the driveway and come around. Also the the trees that are planted there are these overwrought, I mean, almost out of a nightmare kind of tree. As soon as you walk in, you see the beginning of the exposition of all the industrialized components that make up a building, and you realize that this is a different experience. Period, no matter how you cut it, you're in for something other that is not palatable entirely. And as you go through this linear journey, this one-way trip, it's a metaphor for any human being that you were here for a short time. And it's about the Holocaust itself. During the course of the design, they got a hold of an authentic 1934 wooden German boxcar, the real thing. They built a museum around the boxcar because you couldn't put it in afterwards. So that was a great moment where many of the survivors were all in tears on seeing the car. You can see it 
from lots of ways. It's in the void. And the boxcar, it's something you can go in. The void you can't go in at all, because that is for the Jews who did die. It is, in a way, a monument to them. It's their space in the museum. The next major event during construction was the signing of the beams. They had an actual signing where the Holocaust survivors signed the beams themselves. It was a very moving moment. A part of every building that I do, you're trying to educate and you do that architecturally by exposing everything. Ducts, lighting conduit, the light fixtures, piping for fire protection and plumbing. Because when you do expose it all, you're educating. Thus, everything is exposed. It's all about this one-way system. You go one way. You know, the sloping of the floor, it's a very gentle slope that brings you down as you enter. The there's no windows on that side. It's all dark. And you begin to get the message with what with the exhibition design and the sloping floor that you're going towards something fairly horrific. Finally, when you come through, there's a stair in the white side that leads you up to come to the Book of Remembrance. And then you go up along the catwalk looking down at the exhibition and then down another stair not the one you came up. As the second said, that you go up one stair, you come down another stair. Then you come out this way. The cylinder at the end, the room of remembrance, you come to in this circuitous fashion, and these two columns bracket the book of remembrance and that very tall space. Those are the name, the first names of those who died. In etching the names in black as if they're burned into the wall, and make them fade out as they go up and away. It's a very powerful, everybody that's been in that space is moved by it, you can't not be moved. Outside, there are six light standards representing the six million, which are lit at night. Once you understand it's about the number six and six million, you get it. So that's very powerful, it's quite moving. The Room of Reflection is another space which is highly symbolic. There are 12 little places to sit of the same floor material representing the 12 tribes. And then there are the 18 windows with little yurtzeit candles because the number 18 in Hebrew means chai, which means life. This is not just about the Holocaust, it's about Hitler's desire to void out the culture and the history of the Jews. So this has a lot of symbolism that has nothing to do with the Holocaust, but has to do with the Jews who did survive. Those 12 places to sit, you know, are a place to reflect. And if you come to be educated in Holocaust issues and you sit there, you may well have an epiphany about all that you've seen, right? In the meantime, it's highly lit because it's on the white side. And all the windows are oriented east in anticipation of a messianic age. The building is designed in cubits. The Hebrew measurement at the time was a cubit. There's a disjunction between cubits and inches and feet. So if things don't match that's intentional. And the theater is interesting. The theater is a cube, an absolutely perfect cube. That cube is really important because of the cubit, because of perfection and ideal. And this is not an ideal world. And the Holocaust is just a metaphor of the, an extreme, horrible metaphor of imperfection. In the theater, all the stuff is exposed. You would get people who would explain or try to explain the trauma of those years. That's a poignant thing. 
it's a building. I've always wanted to do buildings where poignancy was built into the building. There were a lot of people that impacted the building, and I was, in some level, their pencil, because much of those ideas are theirs. The survivors, they were my client, and they were tough people. They were great. They were great to a person because they're strong and they're brave and they survived the unsurvivable. The Holocaust that happened to the Jews needs to be remembered not just for the Jews but by everyone. And the lesson that you need to take away is about education. Through education you learn to become more civil and accepting of others. Now it's up to you.